This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you're listening to episode 93. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. Before I get into the introduction of this episode, I'd like to thank you all for your words of encouragement and congratulations. I just finished my MBA program at Pepperdine University and graduated on Saturday. What's different about business school that you know going in is, as opposed to medical school or law school, there isn't a prescribed industry for you to enter. Uh, You're prepared to do business in whatever capacity that is. And really, that's why I loved my experience at business school. While everyone jokes that all they did in business school was master Excel and Excel spreadsheets, uh, which is definitely true to an extent, uh, you know, I I am an Apple user, uh, but, but critical thinking was really at the core of my curriculum, from marketing to strategy to even finance. And that's what I've always been passionate about, critical thinking, staying open to new ideas, new ways of thinking about the world, and learning. And if you feel the same and uh, you don't want to become a doctor or a lawyer, just kidding, uh, then I couldn't recommend more that you pursue getting your MBA as well. I'm thankful to Pepperdine and to all my professors along the way. And uh, go Waves! That's almost a perfect segue to introduce my next guest. For this episode of the Planet Microcab podcast, I spoke with Gautam Bade, author of The Joys of Compounding. I'm always looking for new books to read that can offer a new perspective or outlook on the world or investing. What is cool about Gautam's book, The Joys of Compounding, is that it achieves all of these things. As you will hear, we discuss at length his investing style and thesis, but more importantly, how Gautam's passion for learning has served him well in all of life's pursuits. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 93, and please enjoy my interview with Gautam Bade. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hi everyone, Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. As some of you may know, when I'm not interviewing folks for the podcast, I also host CEO video interviews and Wall Street views with investing experts for SNN's YouTube channel, SNN Network. I wanted to take a moment to invite you all to subscribe to the SNN Network YouTube channel. As a subscriber, you'll be the first to be notified when we publish a new CEO video interview with microcap management teams, a new Wall Street View video interview with investing experts, panels and keynote presentations from our conferences, as well as new and archived podcast interviews. Go to www.youtube.com backslash SNNWire and click the subscribe button. Again, that's www.youtube.com youtube.com backslash snn wire and click subscribe thank you for subscribing and for your continued support for this episode of the planet microcap podcast i would like to welcome gautam bade author of the joys of compounding gautam welcome to the planet microcap podcast thank you for having me it's great to have you on and, and thank you for being here. And uh, especially thank you for writing your book, The Joys of Compounding, uh, that, which is the reason why I, I invited you on today. Thanks, Robert. So, so to, uh, to begin here, let, let's start with your background. You know, how, how'd you get your start in the world of finance and investing? So I was born and brought up in a Marwari family in India. And our Marwari community in India is known for having business in our genes. So ever since my late childhood and early teenage years, I was always fascinated by entrepreneurship, especially by the fact that once a solid foundation is built for a business, the owners do not work for money. Rather, money works for them. And uh, I did my bachelor's in commerce with a specialization in accountancy. So pursuing higher studies in the field of finance seemed like a 
natural extension. So I did my MS in finance from ICFI University, Hyderabad, India. And I also did my MBA with a specialization in finance from Nirma University, Ahmedabad, India. Later on, I also got my CFA charter. Uh, after completing my MBA course, I got a campus placement in Citibank in their Mumbai office as an analyst in the investment banking team, wherein I worked for three years. And after that, I joined Deutsche Bank and worked there for three and a half years as a senior analyst in their Mumbai, London and Hong Kong offices. As regards, how did I get my start in the field of investing? Well, as is typically the starting story of many investors in the stock market, I got pulled into the stock market out of sheer greed and during the final euphoric <laughs> phases of a bull market. In my case, it was the 2003 to 2007 bull market in India. Mm -hmm. I invested in, I still remember, I invested in Reliance Power Sector Mutual Fund in late 2007 and a very hot steel stock called Ispath Steel in January 2008 as both of them were in the hot and fancy sectors of the time. And both of these had recently appreciated sharply in a very short span of time when I had first noticed them. So I just engaged in blind extrapolation of the recent price trends in them without paying any attention whatsoever to the valuations. Recency and vividness biases are very powerful but highly costly behavioral mistakes. Both my first two investments crashed 70 to 80 percent within 12 to 18 months of my purchase and I had successfully gained admission into the stock markets by paying my tuition fees. <laughs> Despite this bad initial experience, however, my curiosity and interest about the stock markets always remained very high throughout all the first seven years of my professional investment banking career. And at that point of time, I realized that we just have this one life to live our dreams. And I did not want to waste any further time doing something that I was not passionate about. I was so, so keen for a career shift that I relocated to the US in 2015 without any job in hand. One of my relatives who's an American citizen, he sponsored my green card. I was under the impression that I will easily land a job in my desired profile in the stock market within a short period of time since I was a CFA charter holder and this particular degree is generally considered to be very highly valued in the investment management industry. But as you know, life is not a bed of roses for those trying to sure. carve their own destiny. And I got rejected in my first three stock market job interviews in the first six months, but I did not give up. I was very firm and adamant that I'm not going to go back to my previous field of work where the presence of perverse incentives constantly led to incentive cost bias and conflicts of interests and did not suit my personal nature. So I kept on declining all the investment banking job interview calls that came away in the US, even though they would have had very high dollar salaries. At the same time, I ran out of whatever little money I had brought, brought with me from India. And to take care of my living expenses in the States, I did not want to sell even a single stock from my portfolio of Indian stocks, as I did not want to interrupt the process of compounding. And we were experiencing a very big bull market at the time. So I took up a minimum wage job as a front desk clerk at a hotel in San Francisco, where I used to work during the graveyard shift. For the uninitiated, this is the shift that runs from 11 p.m. at night to 7 a.m. in the morning. Even though it was a very big struggle for me, physically, emotionally, culturally, and intellectually, today in hindsight, I highly value those days of my life because for the first time since the beginning of my professional career, I got some free time for myself to read and learn. This was the phase during which my learning curve really took off from a tiny base. And little did I realize at the time that I was laying down the strong building blocks for compounding in my life. Mm -hmm. The pace of work during late night to early morning at the hotel was pretty slow. And I made full use of the free time to read every single article published on blogs like Safal Nimeshak, Fundu Professor, Janav WordPress, Base Hit Investing and Microcap Club, among many others. The passionate pursuit of uh, lifelong learning had begun. Now, I would like to just spend a uh, few moments talking about the importance of passion during those, 14, during those 14 months at the hotel i distinctly remember every single night i used to fill up at least three job applications online for a stock market job profile and over the course of those 14 months i must have sub filled up and submitted at least more than 1300 job applications now as you must be knowing you know whenever we take the time out to fill up all these forms and you know upload a resume and click the submit button there is so much hope attached behind every single application and to be facing 1300 and more rejections and still keep on going is only and only po possible if you're truly passionate about what you 
want to pursue in life now luck chance serendipity and randomness have pl- always played a big role in various aspects of my life till date one fine night during november 2016 while working at the hotel i randomly clicked on the quick apply button on a job application on linkedin during the course of my routine online job search and uh, wonder of wonders i unexpectedly unexpectedly received a interview call for the job and that too for a senior role in an investment firm even though i had zero formal work experience in the stock market and this was the phase in my life during which i was about to experience the power of compounding knowledge and action mm-hmm. all those hundreds of hours which i had spent during the previous 14 months at the hotel reading all those blog articles had built a very strong intellectual foundation for me in investing mm-hmm. this is what i was lacking during my first three stock market job interviews in the us and as a result i excelled in all the three rounds of my job interview as you know body language derives from self confidence mm-hmm. and self confidence in turn d- derives from knowledge i was offered the role of portfolio manager and it was like a dream come true for me today even after achieving financial freedom i continue to work in my job because i just love the work that i get to do and the icing on the cake is that i get paid for getting to learn and improve every day mm-hmm. wow i mean uh you know look i've i've heard other interviews that you've done and uh, heard your background before and and in reading your book you know there there's you really cover it quite a bit and you know it's pretty incredible what you the the risk that you took you know it's a, because that was a big risk for you you know coming here not re- not knowing anybody and then the, over 1300 job applications i mean you know uh, other than passion i mean did, were you i mean did your family think you were freaking crazy i mean come on let, let's get the di- the down and dirty yes to be honest <laughs> everyone had lost all hope in me thank you you know when you become fanatic about something in life you know you just uh, sure. come across as a round peg in the square hole you know so for sure yeah that time you know and those days were tough i mean i still remember there were many days you know when i was just uh, you know just trying to barely survive i didn't want to you know sell any appreciating asset and you know spend for my living expenses here and there were times when i had to even try to elongate the longevity of my meals by de- eating smaller portions i mean mm. trust me it was very very difficult for sure and i mean san francisco is not cheap either i mean you're you're <laughs> i mean you're you you have to you have to spend a little bit to live up there but, it was tough living i used to mm. live as a paying guest in a small cramped room and that mm. was all that i had with me mm. uh, it was just me and my passion together there was nothing else at that wow. time with me Oh my gosh, that's well, that's amazing. And so, well, one one thing that you mentioned, you know, in in some of the people that you learned from, uh, was uh, uh, Professor Bakshi, or the Fundu Professor. I, I actually uh, I had him on episode forty one, and and you you like I like I said, you mentioned you learned a lot from him. You know, was he one of your inspirations then for writing the book that that we're about to discuss? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, I've learned a lot from his writings and teachings over the years, and I'm very thankful to him. Mm-hmm. I believe is one of the wisest minds in the field of value investing, mm-hmm. and uh, the biggest uh, lesson that I took away from Professor Bakshi is that our good goodwill compounds when we generously share knowledge with others. So mm-hmm. I've just tried to follow in his footsteps. Well, one, one more quick follow up too is you know what what would you say is the ratio for you in terms of your the learning that you've gotten so far from you know what you've read online you know from all these different blogs and whatnot. You know, versus you know the the actual experience of investing and losing money. You know, where what would you say is the ratio there? No particular defined ratio, but <laughs> well, yeah, like, like, I, like, I no my, like I mentioned in my book as well. You know, everything can be a teacher in life when you possess right. the right mindset. So, and uh, learning is a lifelong journey. So I've taken try to learn from you know every single opportunity that I've gotten, be it from you know books or from people or from actual direct experience. Mm-hmm. So it's been a combination of all these aspects. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Well, it is culminated. Well, no, I don't want to say culminated because, as you said, it's it's a continuous process. It never culminates. There's only volume one and then volume infinity, right? So, uh, so I, I again, I, I just actually recently purchased the Joys of Compounding, and uh, before we dive deep into the book itself, you know, and you've already alluded to this a little bit previously, but you know what? Why did you decide to put all of your thoughts and everything you learned into this book, and and then also, what is it fully about? So regarding your first question as to why I decided to write the book uh, mm-hmm. let me just humbly acknowledge that I got far far more than my deserved deserved fair share because I was very lucky and fortunate to experience a very big bull market from December 2013 to December 2017 in India and which took place at around the same time that I deployed a meaningful sum of capital for the first time in stocks 
and uh, you know i just uh, got far far more than i actually deserve to be honest and mm-hmm. by making this book available to all readers at zero profit this is my way of giving back to our investing community from whom i've gotten to learn a lot over the years the second part uh, about what the joys of compounding is about it is my heartfelt tribute to all my teachers who helped me achieve financial independence become a better advisor person and help me embark on the path to a fulfilling and meaningful life mm-hmm. that's that's wonderful i mean uh, again thank thank you for writing this and sharing with us and you know it's cool is I, when i was reading through it I, it 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 really reads almost like a, it's like a journal entry like it, it's a each journal entry that string that that makes sense with each other you know it's like all this makes sense together but it also reads very much like this is coming straight from you i know that sounds very ambiguous even when i say it but it, it it I don't know that that's just how when I was reading it that's how it felt you know I was just like oh I feel like I'm reading Gautam's journal right now you know and and his thoughts and what he's learned um, you know and and but that leads to my next question you know because you leave the title of the book relatively ambiguous you know and and I read it and I and I was thinking you know the joys of compounding what you know information knowledge skills etc you know was that deliberate no so basically. <sighs> the principles emphasized throughout the book power the lifelong compounding journey of a value investor mm-hmm. if you notice in the first chapter i've actually shown a chart on compounding right. by the time the reader finishes reading the last page of the book he would have a clear understanding of the deep significance behind that particular chart of on compounding compounding mm-hmm. permeates almost every aspects of our lives and that in a sense is what this book is all about mm-hmm. so then uh, again there there's so much to cover in your book so so i'll start here you know, uh, what was your favorite chapter to write? Well, uh, this is a really tough one, but <laughs> if I had to choose one, it would have to be chapter number five, which is titled "The Importance of Choosing the Right Role Models, Teachers, and Associates in Life." In that, I've paid tribute to my parents, my favorite role models, and my teachers. And since it was one of the most personal chapters to write, um, I would say that was my favorite. Mm-hmm. I'm also guessing that was the fastest chapter to write as well, because if it's your favorite, you you know you knocked that one out in in ten minutes. <laughs> well, it, well, to be honest, every chapter took a long time to write. Uh, <laughs> you know, writing really forces you to think a lot, very deeply about sure. any subject. Mm-hmm. So yes, right. So so now to to start from chapter one, you know, and and, and in there you wrote. You know, uh, everything in lo- you you actually said this quote earlier already in this interview, but you know, I wanted to dig deeper into it. Everything in life can be a teacher when you process when you possess the right mindset. You know, for you, what would you say is the right mindset to achieve this? Humility, Robert. Mm-hmm. Humility. Let me share a, a small passage from my book to illustrate this important life principle. Mm-hmm. The wiser we get, the more we realize how little we know. A lesser known and one of my all-time favorite equation from Albert Einstein rings true: ego equals one by knowledge. More the knowledge, lesser the ego; lesser the knowledge, more the ego. The deeper one dives into any field, the humbler one generally becomes. By demonstrating intellectual humility and acknowledging what we don't know, we are putting ourselves into a beneficial position to learn more. Mm-hmm. Thus, the dawning of wisdom. There is no true expert knowledge in life and investing, only varying degrees of ignorance. This is not a problem to solve. It's simply how the world works. We cannot know everything, but we can work hard to become just about smart enough to make above average decisions over time, and that is the key to successful compounding. Mm-hmm. That's a very that's a very postmodern mindset. You know, previous in I studied a little bit of philosophy in college and. You know, prior to the 19, I guess I would say 80s and 90s, you know, the whole pursuit of philosophy was to really try and find the truth and and, and trying to find the true nature of things or the way things are. But ultimately, what it, what some philosophers put forth was that, you know, you can only the, the best pursuit in life is trying to is learning as much as you can to get towards that truth, but there's a good chance you'll never get there, you know, but that's okay because the journey, the, the education is in the journey, not so much in the end result. You know, would you, sure. would, would, I mean, would you say that's a very similar sentiment that you're trying to put forth in your book? Yes. Yes. It is all about the passionate pursuit of lifelong learning. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, also in the, in the first chapter you stated, uh, 
And I quote, today, after having successfully achieved financial freedom through my passionate pursuit of lifelong learning, I can happily say that I'm a better investor because I'm a lifelong learner and I'm a better lifelong learner because I am an investor, end quote. Would you say that this is your thesis for the book? Broadly, yes, but I wouldn't restrict it to only investing. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is because compounding does not apply only to money. Social and intellectual capital also compound. Mm -hmm. Investing in yourself, in your relationships, and in your understanding of the world pays massive dividends over time. And this is what the broad thesis of the book is all about. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting that I, and this is from, you know, since starting my podcast and, and taking, you know, to interviewing with you, is that investors and seem to be a, a, other than ones that maybe just focus on mining or biotech something that requires a little bit more expertise you know but it seems that investors like uh, let's say you know people who write literature or, or literature arts professors or historians you know there there's such a broad base of knowledge that mm-hmm. investors feel they need to know in order to be a good investor you know, and that that's so when you when you say that, you know, it, compounding it, it also not just, you know, from, you know, the financial capabilities that you need to have, but also making sure that you have this broad base of knowledge. I mean, it also does help in your investing knowledge because it might open doors to new ways of thinking about a different industry. Well, that's very true. In fact, I mentioned in the book as well that I've often discovered intriguing connections relevant for understanding the world of business by reading books from other disciplines, including evolutionary biology, physics, history, psychology, philosophy, creativity, and leadership, among many others. Mm -hmm. I would uh, recommend readers to read Roger Von Oak's book uh, called Creative Backpack. Mm -hmm. They are a great tool to inculcate lateral thinking. Mm -hmm. So so your, your, your passion for learning and reading is is very evident in this interview, as well as in the book. You know, and, and for you, you know, you, you read to increase knowledge, find meaning, and, and for better understanding of others and yourself. Is learning and reading mutually inclusive or can learning not take place without some reading? Learning can take place from anywhere, like I mentioned earlier also, right? Books, experiences, people, everything in life. I keep saying, you know, everything in life can be a teacher when you possess the right mindset. In fact, Guy Spire, one of my role models, he has written about this very important life principle in his book, The Education of a Value Investor. Let me share that particular passage with you. Mm -hmm. In his book, Guy Spire writes, there is no more important aspect of our education as investors, business people, and human beings than to find these exceptional role models who can guide us on our own journey. Books are a priceless source of wisdom, but people are the ultimate teachers. And there may be lessons that we can only learn from observing them or being in their presence. In many cases, these lessons are never communicated verbally, yet you feel the guiding spirit of that person when you're with them. Mm -hmm. So so then, I mean, because this was kind of a leading question, you know, in, in the sense that because you can tell from 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 reading your book and and again from you know already talking to you thus far is that reading is such an important aspect of your of your learning you know and there's some out there that you know they're just either they're not good at at learning from reading or they just maybe they they're dyslexic and there's they have issues in that so you know i was just i i'm i guess what i'm trying to get at here is you know how would you then go about or what what would your be would be your your recommendations for those maybe who have difficulties in in taking in new information and knowledge that way so that they can also pursue their passion like you have in your life so when you want to learn a new subject uh, identify the fundamental principles first mm-hmm. if you look at all the great thinkers in, great thinkers in the world all of them think in terms of first principles and uh, then you need to learn those first in a clear and deep manner Mm-hmm. And the refinement technique, which I've talked about in my book, is a very effective way to do this. Mm-hmm. It is named after Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. And it is a great method for learning anything in a clearer and deeper manner and improving our retention skills. Mm-hmm. There, are four, there are four simple steps to the Feynman technique. Step number one, pick and study a topic. Step number two, take out a blank sheet of paper and write at the top the subject you want to learn. Write out what you know about the subject as if you were teaching it to someone who is unfamiliar with the topic. Not your smart adult friend, but rather a 
you know, 10 to 12 year old who can just about understand basic concepts and relationships. Step number three, when you must use simple language that a child can understand, you force yourself to understand the concept at a deeper level and to simplify relationships and connections between ideas. If you struggle at this stage, now you have a clear understanding of where you have some gaps. This is very valuable feedback because you have now discovered the edge of your mental capabilities. And as Charlie Munger has said, knowing the limits of your knowledge is the dawning of wisdom. Step number four, return to the source material, reread and relearn it. Repeat step number two and compile information that will help you fill in the gaps in your understanding, which you identified in step number three. Review and simplify further as necessary. So this is a summary of the four steps of the Feynman technique. And following these four steps, anyone, anyone can become better at learning any given topic. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, for, for you, this is, and I'm, I'm just assuming, and I'm, because you put it in your book, this is what, this is the technique that you used when you were trying to really accelerate your growth curve or your learning curve? Yes. This is one of the techniques. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you, did you look at other techniques as well and, and, and really try and balance out which one worked better? Or was this one you, as soon as you read, you're like, that's me. I, I will learn like that. Like this is for sure it. No, but there is no, you know, limit to constant improvement. So, you know, let me just, you know, on a related note, let me also talk about the practical ways for us to improve our thinking because, you know, learning and thinking both go side by side. Right, many people, of course. You know, you, you know, you cannot do one without the other. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are uh, many practical ways for us to improve our, our thinking. Now, in their book, The Five Elements of Effective Thinking, Dr. Edward Berger and Dr. Michael Starbird, outline some practical ways for us to improve our thinking. Let me share their insights, which I've outlined in my book. The first way to improve our thinking is to understand deeply. When you learn something, go for depth and make it rock solid. Any concept that you're trying to master is a combination of simple core ideas. Identify the core ideas and learn them deeply. This deeply ingrained knowledge base can serve as a meaningful springboard for more advanced learning and action in your field. It's important to be very honest with yourself. If you do not understand something, go back to the core concepts again and again. Remember that merely memorizing stuff is not deep learning. The second way to improve our thinking is to embrace mistakes and learn from them. Mistakes highlight unforeseen opportunities as well as gaps in our understanding. And mistakes are great teachers. As Michael Jordan once said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Mm -hmm. The key takeaway is that we cannot come out with a correct solution on the first attempt. Mm -hmm. Start with a probable solution, that is the initial hypothesis, and keep on correcting the mistakes until you arrive at the correct solution. Thomas Edison was famous for using this approach for his inventions. When he said that invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, the perspiration was the process of incrementally making mistakes and learning from them to make the next attempts apt to be closer to right. When Edison was asked how he felt about his countless failed attempts at making a light bulb, he replied, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. The third way to improve our thinking is to raise questions. If you want to deepen your understanding, you need to raise questions. Do not be afraid to show your ignorance. If you do not understand, ask. The great philosopher Socrates used to challenge his students to make new discoveries by asking them uncomfortable core questions, which often led them to new insights. The fourth way to improve our thinking is to follow the flow of ideas. To truly understand a concept, discover how it evolved from simpler concepts. Recognizing that present reality is a moment in a continuing evolution makes your understanding fit into a more coherent structure. You cannot discover everything on your own. You need to use the existing idea and improve it. Edison was supremely successful at inventing product after product, exploiting the maxim that every new idea has utility beyond its original intent. He used to say, I start where the last man left off. More poignantly, he noted that many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. The fifth uh, and final way which uh, Dr. Edward Berger and Dr. Michael Starbert outline in their book is to embrace change. 
you need to shrug off a lifetime's habit of accepting a relatively superficial level of understanding and start learning more deeply you need to let go of the constraining forces in your life and let yourself fail on the road to success you should question all the issues you have taken for granted all those years view every aspect of your world as a stream of insights and ideas be amenable to change each of us forever remains a work in progress always evolving ever changing we are all rough drafts of the person we are still becoming learning is a lifelong journey mm-hmm. so i i as a quick follow up to to ways of thinking improving our thinking and ways of learning you know at what at what point do you have to tell yourself okay you know for this goal that i want to achieve i'm going to you know like have you ever read um uh, the unbearable lightness of being by milan kundera not yet not no, yet i highly recommend because it talks about you know the lightness in living a life where you you know you're not making crucial heavy decisions you know versus mm-hmm. someone who's so bound by their you know i'm a, i believe in this and it's and it's not and it's immovable you know and yet you know there's there's this idea that puts forth in the book where you know there's on the one hand you can live this live, live this light life where you still are accomplishing things in life and and you know but there's also there's this feeling of missing out on the heaviness that can lead to a lot more fulfillment potentially you know because you are or you believe in something if it comes to fruition you know then it's very fulfilling in your life and likewise if it doesn't become a uh, happen you know it it can it can be somewhat of a roller coaster you know but 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 in in thinking about learning and and then putting some of what you learn into action you know at what point do you stop the questioning and then you and then you you take that little morsel and capitalize on it good question so basically by focusing on the fundamental questions and then while as answering them going two or three levels deeper by asking and then what at every step mm-hmm. we arrive at the truth mm-hmm. this is the art of redu- reductionism mm-hmm. which i've talked about in my book as well so right. less is more when we when we remove the things that aren't that that are not true representations of reality we get closer and closer to the ultimate truth mm-hmm. in fact let me share a story here so michelangelo Please. was once asked by the pope about the secret of his genius particularly with regards to the statue of david one of the greatest scup- uh, sculpting masterpieces of all time michelangelo responded by saying david was always there in the marble i just took away everything that was not david ah. so this is the art of red so this basically answers your question how we get to the ultimate truth yeah did you ever, did you actually uh, read uh, agony in the ecstasy uh, not yet oh, <laughs> oh hi you you are just adding to my anti <laughs> <reading> <laughs> you know, I, you know I, i think in my life i've read more of you know the the i love history books you know and and maybe and well agony in the ecstasy is more of like a romanticized version of michelangelo's life but the there's there's a great story in the book about how he because it, he got to to actually sculpt the david uh using because it was a contest for this special piece of marble that was uh that i believe was mined very close to florence and mm-hmm. he he was one of the sculptors that submitted an idea for for this and he actually won uh i don't think that's giving too much away it's a it's a great story in the book but i digress i i I digress. Um so so going back to the book, you know, and and in in chapter 3, you also discuss the the lattice work model. And how is how and also how this is what Charlie Munger chose to convey the idea of interconnectedness. You know, what what does this model mean and how does Munger use this to his benefit? So in his book, Charlie Munger the Complete Investor, Trent Griffin lays out Munger's path. to worldly wisdom uh, let me just quickly share that great passage with you mm-hmm. uh, in it in, in it in this book uh, griffin writes munger has adopted an approach to business and life that he refers to as worldly wisdom munger believes that by using a range of different models from many different disciplines psychology history mathematics physics philosophy biology and so on a person can use the combined output of the synthesis to produce something that has more value then the sum of its parts robert hackstrom wrote a wonderful book on worldly wisdom entitled investing the last liberal art in which he states that each discipline entwines with and in the process strengthens every other 
from each discipline the thoughtful person draws significant mental models the key ideas that combine to produce a cohesive understanding those who cultivate this broad view are well on their way to achieving worldly wisdom it is clear that munger loves to learn he actually has fun when he is learning and that makes the worldly wisdom investing process enjoyable for him mm-hmm. this is important because many people do not find investing enjoyable especially when compared to gambling which science has shown can generate pleasure via chemicals like dopamine even though it is an activity with a negative net present value now to answer your question uh, how does munger use this mental model framework to his benefit griffin writes what munger has done is created a system of worldly wisdom that allows him to generate the same chemical rewards in an activity that has a positive net present value when you learn something new your brain gives itself a chemical reward which motivates you to do the work necessary to be a successful investor if you do this work and adopt a worldly wisdom mindset munger believes you will create an investing edge over, over, over the other investors so this basically answers your question how does munger use this lattice work model to his benefit mm-hmm. yep so my it's in, it's interesting because you know i i i i actually just did an interview um with uh, Todd Wenning from uh, Ensemble Capital that my audience uh, by the time this this comes out that that interview probably has been published but um i love that point about how investing is the last liberal art because uh one thing we talked about with Todd is you know he has his liberal arts degree and you know yeah, he yeah. is a his, history major and he had all this knowledge and he goes what am i going to do with this uh, politics or finance you know and so it's it's interesting in 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 that sense so uh, i i can definitely appreciate that i was a liberal arts major in in many respects so um so again you know i, I don't mean to skip too many chapters here but but i wanted to discuss your chapter on uh, achieving financial independence you know you you state that uh and i quote it enables you to look at reality in a truly unbiased manner end quote you know does it really and and i and i'd love to understand this point a little bit better and and then also for you how did you achieve financial independence so to answer the first part of your question uh, see truth is hard to assimilate in any mind when it is opposed by interest you cannot really understand how the world truly works unless you have financial independence once you achieve this state it changes everything it enables you to look at reality in a truly unbiased manner everyone should aim to achieve financial independence at the earliest because that is when we will start seeing the world as it really is it is difficult to think and act long term unless you are financially independent as upton sinclair famously said it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it <laughs> so financial independence doesn't mean that you don't work just that you don't need to mm-hmm. it removes the internal distraction of unpredictable employment and the many people don't understand this but the goal of financial independence is not really about achieving a certain level of money it's about you know being able to stop being dependent on others like a bosses clients a fixed schedule a paycheck true wealth is measured in terms of personal liberty and freedom not monetary currency money by itself does not signify independence control over our time does <clears throat> there is only one definition of success to be able to spend your life in your own way for example today even after achieving financial independence i continue to work in a job because i just love to i just love the work that i get to do every day and i feel a sense of joy and you know, i just feel a sense of joy in doing what i love and loving what i do mm-hmm. so the basic crux of financial independence is that is that it gives you a lot of flexibility and, and options in life that's one now the second part of your question as to how did you know when did i consider myself financially independent it was basically when my passive income and recurring cash flows from rental properties dividends and interests were more than sufficient to cover my uh, annual cash burn personal cash burn rate at the same time i also had an adequate life insurance cover and adequate health insurance cover and i'd also set up a a liquid emergency fund to cover more than one year of my living expenses so that is when i really considered myself to, to have covered myself from all sides and ensured financial independence mm-hmm. wow and, you know my uh, what what's interesting with with this concept and the reason i asked about it is because it's one of those things where you know you hear people like oh they're rich like they can just do whatever the hell they want and they're you know they're they're fine like oh they did that like of course they could they don't have to worry about money but what's interesting in how you put it is that it's nuanced it's like well you know look if you're if you that that's your goal 
you you want to be. And look, not everybody's fortunate maybe to be born into a wealthy family and whatnot. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, that should be your goal if you really want true freedom. And that and like you said, it doesn't mean financially, you know, it's just being able to have that as much personal freedom as you want in, in the true sense cool. of being, being comfortable. Financial independence, Robert, is all about a state of mind. Mm -hmm. It's all about the mind. It's all about the mindset. That's mm -hmm. it. Learning to live with less, learning to be content with less is a superpower. That mm -hmm. is true wealth and freedom. Being, a, being, you know, just being happy in any situation in life, you know, that is true, you know, true independence. And that is true wealth and freedom. And, uh, you know, I would highly encourage readers to study the field of stoicism. That really helps build in this, you know, firm resolve in our minds. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. So my, my next question then is, uh, you know, what, what is the inner scorecard and, and how does this work? So the inner scorecard is the inner set of criteria and standards by which a person judges himself. If in your heart, you know who you really are and that what you did was the right thing to do, then the criticism of others should be considered and analyzed to see whether it truly has any merit, but it should not be given permission to belittle what you're trying to achieve. The, the essence of the inner scorecard is, can be summed up in these few lines. Let your life be guided by internal principles, not external validation. Self-respect beats social approval every time. We are not perfect, nor should we pretend to be. But the endeavor should always be to be the best version of ourselves we can be. Don't live a life based on approval from others. Be authentic. Act in accordance with who you are and what you believe in or one day your mask will fall off. If Warren Buffett was living by the standards of others, he would have not been able to maintain the firm independence of mind that has helped him avoid many financial bubbles and the subsequent personal misery. It is a significant lesson for all investors. And I've shared this in my book as well. So as an investor, Buffett thinks entirely for himself and invests only according to his personal investment philosophy. During 1999, in the midst of the internet bubble, Buffett was being humiliated by some of the leading financial commentators of the time and Berkshire's stock price was getting hammered. But Buffett always kept in mind what he had been taught by his father, that the only scorecard that counts is your inner scorecard. In December 1999, Barron's, puts, Barron's uh, put Buffett on its cover with the headline, Warren, what's wrong? The accompanying article said Berkshire had, Berkshire had stumbled badly. Warren Buffett was facing a kind of negative press like nothing he had ever experienced. Many long-time value investors who followed Buffett's investment philosophy had either shut down their firms or given in and bought bubble technology stocks. Buffett did not. What he called his inner scorecard, a toughness about personal decisions that had infused him for as long as anyone could remember, kept him from wavering and he steadfastly adhered to his long-held principles. He never forgot his teacher's Ben Graham's words. In this short run, the market is a voting machine. But in the long run, it is a big machine. Mm -hmm. so, so then I'd say the, the first half of the book was providing tools and ideas that helped you as an individual in order to set you up to become the best investor that you could be. You know, so starting with around chapter 13 and 14, we start to get into the nitty gritty of your investing thesis and strategy. You know, you discuss ROIC, understanding intrin intrinsic value, competitive advantage, etc., you know, in studying and applying all of these traditional value investing principles, what would you say has worked best for you to achieve financial independence? So all these three concepts that you just mentioned are all, are all interlinked, actually. So mm -hmm. the return on in, in, incremental invested capital is what drives intrinsic value creation. And a high ROIC is typically an indication of some form of a competitive advantage, like a strong brand with pricing power, a network effect, high switching costs, or a low cost advantage. And with regards to what worked best for me to achieve financial independence, I would say my frugality, uh, disciplined savings habit, daily gratification, uh, continuous learning mindset. And of course, which I mentioned, talk about in detail in the book as well, uh, luck, chance, serendipity, and randomness. Mm -hmm. So so then, I mean, for you, I mean, this is really getting into like your your actual thesis itself, you know, your investing thesis. You know, I mean, would you say there's anything nuanced and, and different than maybe some of the traditional value investing strategy or, or is it more or less the same and you just you tend to focus on certain areas more so than others? You know, how, how, how would you answer that? 
So I would say, you know, more than fi- trying to find a, you know, cheaply valued stock, it's more important to identify the right business. Mm. You know, o- over the long term, you know, it's much more profitable to invest in, uh, you know, internal compounding machines because, you know, if you play on mean reversion and cheap valuations, then you have to keep recycling the ideas again and again, and that right. increases the chances for error. So over time, you know, I've just re- realigned my portfolio to have more of the high quality compounders. And I firmly believe that owners of outstanding businesses just tend to sleep better at night. And at this stage of my life, after having achieved financial independence, after working very, very hard, I focus a lot more on stress adjusted returns rather than absolute gross returns. For me, I just want lower level, of, you know, much more lower level of stress <laughs> for each of so. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, you know you come to the right podcast, the small micro nano caps. You know, I I, I must say. <laughs> uh, so in in chapter sixteen, you title it, uh, and I quote: "The three most important words in investing." End quote. You know, uh, sorry to be a spoiler here, but uh, you say that those three most important words are margin of safety. And I have to ask you, why is that? It is because one single year of a big loss can undo all the hard work and sacrifices of the past in you know in figure 16.2 in the book which is probably one of the most important uh, figures in the entire book mm-hmm. I've, ex- I've actually demonstrated this uh, phenomena so let me you know share a few numbers from there to illustrate this point mm-hmm. <clears throat> assuming that you compounded your capital at 15% for 2 years and then lost 15% in year 3 your 3 year cagr compounded rate of return would fall to 4% if you compounded a capital at 15% for three years and lost 15% in, in year four, your four-year CAGR would be 6.6%. If you compounded your capital at 15% for four years and lost 15% in year five, your five-year CAGR falls to just 8.3%. Now, these findings become more stark when you start compounding at an even higher rate of return. For instance, if you compound your money at 30% for two years, but lose 30% in the third year, your three-year CAGR collapses to 5.8%. If you compound your money at 30% for three years, but lose 30% in year four, your four-year CAGR becomes just 11.4%. If you compound your money at 30% for four years, great performance, but you lose 30% in year five, your five-year CAGR collapses to less than 15%. No wonder Warren Buffett has said, rule number one, never lose money. And rule number two, never forget rule number one. (laughs) <laughs> that's uh, the you know the reason uh the margin of safety also st- stuck out to me too is again being on a, a focusing in the small micro nano cap universe that that we are here you know that is uh probably the most recited uh three words <laughs> when i talk to a lot of people you know when not just wanting to find cheap cheap stocks but you know you one of the things you're always looking for and you want to have is that margin of safety, which you can never be fully comfortable with. And, and that's probably not necessarily just for small micro nano caps. I mean, you some people I know probably would never feel comfortable with that with even mid cap or large companies, you know, or large large cap companies. So, you know, I mean, I have to ask just as a quick side note, you know, for from your perspective, looking at small micro nano cap space, you know, uh, how, what, what's a comfortable level of margin of safety? you know, in, for you, if you were to look at, at this this area? The key uh, you know, insight here is that if profitable reinvestment can take place for a long period of time at high rates of return, then, you know, forget nano caps, micro caps, small caps, mid caps, large caps, mega caps, all these are just categorizations, okay? All that matters is, can you find a business which can reinvest capital at a very high rate of return for a very, very long period of time? So, you know, my, in my case itself, I've invested in a, you know, small, I'd invested two years ago in a very small micro, you know, nano cap in India, which was just $4 million in market cap, beat that, <laughs> just $4 million in market cap. But it but it had a new business division, which had, you know, ROICs of more than 100%. And the, man, the management's emphasis was going to be on that particular division going forward. And they were going to reduce their focus on the legacy low return business. That stock has already been a, you know, been a multi-bagger since then. So you have... No, it's not about the market cap categorization as, categorization as such. The value investing principles apply across market cap spectrums. You just mm-hmm. need to, I think, over you know, over the last ten years, what I've realized it, what I've realized is that investing is less a field of finance and more, you know, more a field of personal behavior. The key to investing success is no, no, now not really, you know, the kind of business, you know, just uh, about the written ratios and numbers. It's also about how you behave and mm-hmm. your temperament. 
Mm-hmm. So it having the discipline to say no to 90% of the opportunities and you know just then investing only in the truly outstanding opportunities that requires a lot of uh, discipline so that is what is really challenging for most people it took me so many years to you know just start having a very high hurdle rate mm-hmm. for my incoming investments and ever since i started doing that my churn rate drastically went down portfolio stability improved the quality of you know the portfolio improved and i'm still you know in the process of churning but <laughs> i think over time it will gravitate towards a more high quality you know long term portfolio right. and i'll just you know probably have much more lesser weight in the commodities and cyclicals because at this stage of my life it's more about you know capital preservation and steady right. growth All right well i you know i have a dumb question for you because i have talked a lot about um uh behavioral finance or behavioral investing on here you know a few times and i, I just you know just i thought i'd uh, throw this out at you you know is there an investing strategy for all different personality traits, you know, for those who may have a quick temperament to, you know, not so quick or mild, man, you know, is, is there a, a successful investing strategy for all those different types of personality traits out there? Yes. And it goes back to the core principles of Benjamin Graham, which was to just to buy a business for what, for less than what it is worth. That's what value investing is. <laughs> all those you know different roundabout questions which we you know discussion we keep having <laughs> ultimately it all you know boils down to just one single thing buying a asset for less than what it is worth there's nothing else there's just we just try to just unnecessarily make investing too too complex it's not that complex just focus on you know the three key three key tenets from the intelligent investor which is number one look at stocks as part ownership of a business mm-hmm. number two you know use mr you know mr market to your advantage make mm-hmm. him your friend not your, not, not your enemy and welcome uh, you know abrupt uh, low you know sharp downside volatility and number 3 always you know take into consideration uh, you know a margin of safety in case of a mediocre or bad asset it will be the price in case of a you know the uh, quality compounders it will be the quality of the business and the management that's that that really is it i mean that just these few basic principles will make you a successful investor over the long term in chapter 5 you know you you or sorry in chapter 25 you offer up Munger's checklist when evaluating a potential investment. Do you use the same checklist for yourself personally, or you know, are there some nuanced elements here that that you discuss in the book? Uh, the checklist that you're referring to is part of my broader personal uh, checklist. Mm-hmm. In Poor Charlie's Almanac, uh, Peter Kaufman summarized Munger's investing principles <clears throat> in uh, a checklist form. Uh, it's a must read for all investors. And those checklist items include risk, independence, preparation, intellectual humility, analytic rigor, allocation, patience, decisiveness, change, and focus. Now, it is important to note that the ideal checklist is very subjective and varies from individual to individual. A borrowed or outsourced checklist is not recommended. Every investor needs to build his or her her own checklist based on one's unique experiences, knowledge, and previous mistakes. a checklist created in this manner would be most useful. Mm-hmm. So earlier in the book you you discuss karma and uh the importance of charity. And you you also reference that also in this in the interview as well. You know, but then later you discuss how it's important to acknowledge the role of uh luck, chance, serendipity and randomness. You know, do these concepts go hand in hand for you? well all these concepts uh, play their respective important roles in our lives mm-hmm. uh, with regards to philanthropy uh, since you know as investors we are able to create wealth only with the help of others so giving back also needs to be a part of our planning and with regards to karma our good deeds today inevitably lead to instances of good luck in future mm-hmm. work hard today to let good luck find you tomorrow Got it. So, you know, after writing your book and and our discussion of it, you know, for you, what would you say is the true essence of compounding? So, Warren Buffett, Ben Franklin, and Charlie Munger's lives teach us that just showing up every day and chipping away at it one small block at a time eventually yields great dividends. Dogged incremental progress over a long period of time is the key to success. Mm-hmm. And this, in a sense. is what compounding is all about let me share a great quote of charlie munger from poor charlie's almanac in that book he writes he says spend each day trying to be a little wiser than you were when you woke up discharge your duties faithfully and well step by step you get ahead but not necessarily in fast spurts slug it out one inch at a time day by day at the end of the day if you live long enough most people get 
what they deserve wisdom right there this is what compounding is all about mm -hmm. so one one overarching theme while reading your book and, and other investing books as well and after over 90 interviews here on the podcast you know one thing i've i've really found is that investing necessitates learning and where ways of learning and the desire to understand strategies for learning you know what why do you think this is important for investing because uh... It helps us keep pace with the ever-changing ever realities of the world around us. Mm -hmm. And it also helps us to seize highly profitable opportunities from time to time, as in when they arise. So let me share a few examples to illustrate this particular important point. Markets often overreact to negative but short-term company-specific events that have negligible impact on long-term intrinsic value. Critical thinking is always difficult, but it's almost impossible when we are scared. There is no room for facts when our minds are occupied by fear. Once fear about one aspect gets into the minds of people, they can't see other things some distance away. As an example, in on 1st October 2018, the stock of Bandhan Bank in India was locked in 20% lower circuit because of a negative short-term development which had negligible impact on the bank's long-term intrinsic value. But because I had previously read Tamil Bandhupadhyaya's business biography titled Bandhan, the Making of a Bank, it helped me in obtaining a more sound understanding of the business and in building the necessary conviction to you know, be very bullish on this particular great banking franchise at a discounted price. The stock of Bandhan Bank has already appreciated significantly, significantly since that particular date. One more example. I'm currently studying a very promising cloud-based solutions company listed in the US. Now, software as a service businesses tend to enjoy a recurring revenue stream and sticky long-term client relationships. Since I plan to buy and hold this stock for the long term, I'm currently reading a book titled Subscribed by Teen Zhu. And this will help me develop a more solid understanding of these subscription business models. Now, what is the big takeaway from these examples? It is this. What differentiates successful investors from mediocre ones is passion. Having a strong passion for lifelong learning is a durable competitive advantage for an investor. Investing isn't just a process of wealth creation. It is a source of great happiness and sheer intellectual delight for the truly passionate investor. Mm -hmm. So... Gautam, you, uh, you've, you've gone through quite a few experiences throughout this interview um, that clearly shaped who you are as a person, who you are as an investor. But I have to ask, you know, what, what investing experience would you say has helped shape the person you are today? Well, there have been uh, many, many experiences. So, you know, starting from the December 2013 to December right. 2017 bull market mm -hmm. in India uh, and uh, followed by the bear market since uh, January of last year. So, you know, initially there was a a slight anxiety and some nervous excitement when I deployed a meaningful sum of ca personal capital in late 2013. Mm -hmm. It was followed by moments of overconfidence, complacency and hubris during the raging bull market of the following four years. <laughs> and it culminated with the humility and wisdom gained during the bear market of the last 18 months. This is what the joys of compounding is all about. It is about the journey of a value investor and his life's biggest learnings. The joys of compounding is my story. Mm -hmm. So then what advice would you have for new investors in the stock market? It is this, that the best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. The more you learn, the more you earn. As Ben Franklin very aptly said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Vicariously learn from others throughout life, embrace everlasting humility to succeed in this endeavor, and most importantly, embrace the power of long-term compounding. All the great things in life come from compound interest. Mm -hmm. Well, Gautam, this is, I, I can't, I feel like I've, I, I, we, we've just taken a full on philosophy class today. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm really so thankful that you wrote this book and you joined me here today. So, you know, I, uh, where can my audience go and find more information about you and to buy your book, The Joys of Compounding? Readers can get more information about the book on thejoysofcompounding.com and they can buy a copy from Amazon and book depository websites. Great. Well, Gautam, th thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, 
I, I'm waiting for volume two already. Come on, you got to get you got to get going here. <laughs> I'll keep the audience posted. Don't worry. Oh, good. Well, thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Robert. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and thank you, Gautam, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, and on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast. Have a great week, everyone.